Can you explain the purpose of breathing to all of us? Yes, as human beings, what do we survive on? You know, we, we eat food, we drink water, and we breathe air. And when oxygen meets with the food that we eat, it generates energy. So the powerhouse, the human organism is fueled by the air that we breathe and the food that we eat. And in essence, it's it's as simple as that. Well, what we're going to learn today from you, and one of the reasons why I am so excited to talk to you, is that while breathing is really simple, most of us are doing it incorrectly. And so I would love to start with, how are we supposed to breathe and what are we doing wrong? Yes, that's a good question. Um, we would have been breathing correctly for hundreds and thousands of years. And breathing is very delicate. It's very susceptible to change. It's very susceptible to the food that we eat, the, the lifestyle that we lead, the trauma, the stress that we experience, the excessive talking, the sedentary lifestyle, you know, the office-based jobs. Many factors influence breathing. So, and for some of us, we're more prone to developing poor breathing patterns than others. And very often it becomes a habit. And we have to think of it's such a vital function. You know, earlier on, we spoke about spoke about how important breathing is. And we as human beings, we can live without air for just a few minutes. And the importance of a function is determined by how soon the organism perishes when we switch it off. So it must meet certain criteria. And people often talk about the quality of air that we are breathing, you know. Mm be out in the countryside, be at the seaside, don't be breathing polluted air. But what about the quantity? What about how we breathe? Breathing should be subtle, it should be light, and mm. breath should be undetectable. The perfect person breathes as if they do not breathe. Your breathing should be so smooth that the fine hairs within the nostrils do not move. And if you look at the breathing of a healthy person, their breathing is nose, it's light, it's slow, and it's low. And it's pretty much undetectable. And if they do physical exercise, their breathing is pretty light for the given intensity of physical exercise they are doing. So maybe we should start with what are we doing wrong? What do you want us to know about that? Well, the foundation of breathing is breathing in and out through the nose mouth. You know, when I'm working with, with anybody, I'll always ask, like, what does your mouth do when it comes to breathing? And if you breathe through your mouth, what part of the body moves? So if you look down at your chest, yeah. and if you take a breath through the mouth, okay. and as you breathe through the mouth, you'll notice that your breathing is faster and your breathing is more upper chest. Yes, I can't that get was, it down. Like, I feel like it stays tight, like just is. under my boobs. You know, it's like yeah. right in there. So, and then we have to ask, well, what effect does that have in the physiology? Well, mouth breathing faster breathing and upper chest breathing is activating a greater fight or flight response. So how should we be breathing? Our breathing should be in and out through the nose. And there was an American ear, nose and throat doctor back in 1976 called Dr. Morris Cottle, C-O-T-T-L-E. And he said that the human nose is responsible for 30 functions in the human body. Really? And I, 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 yeah, I couldn't find his list. So I wrote my own list of 30 functions. Really? So I can go me through them it, now if you want. <laughs> I want to hear about some because I think, okay, I smell, I sniff. I, yes. I tend to get very prone to sinus infections and bronchitis and that kind of stuff. So it also gets clogged. Those are basically the three things that my nose does. Yes. Um, when you breathe through your nose continuously, oxygen uptake in the blood increases by nearly 10%. And that's discovered back in 1988 by a researcher, Swift. When you breathe through your nose during physical exercise, the gas carbon dioxide is higher in the blood. And discovered back in 1904 that when carbon dioxide increases and blood pH drops, the red blood cells release oxygen more readily to the tissues and organs. So if you, during rest or during physical exercise, breathe in and out through your nose, you're going to increase not only oxygen uptake, but also oxygen delivery to the working muscles and tissues and organs, including the brain. You know, we can influence the blood flow to the brain by changing our breathing patterns. And it's not about taking the full big breath. Other factors that you wouldn't consider are visuospatial awareness. So throughout our evolution, if we, we for example, we were in a, a wide open space, we had to be able to see what was ahead of us, but also to scan the environment for predators. 
And that's higher with nasal breathing versus mouth breathing. Memory and attention is higher with nose breathing versus mouth breathing. There's greater recruitment of the diaphragm and the diaphragm breathing muscle isn't just for respiration, but it provides stabilization for the spine. So 50% of people with lower back pain have dysfunctional breathing. And as you breathe through your nose, you spoke about bronchitis. We have to think of the gas called nitric oxide. And this gas was first discovered on the exhale breath of the human being in 1991. This gas is antiviral, it's antibacterial, it redistributes blood throughout the lungs, it helps to open up the airways. So people with respiratory complaints, but people who are prone to COVID. You know, when we think of the hundreds of thousands of people with asthma and bronchitis and bronchiectasis and COPD and different respiratory illnesses, why are we leaving them breathe through their mouths? And nobody seems to be telling them, breathe through your nose. And that was my first, you know, kind of steps into the whole world of breathing. My own personal journey was having asthma. I was a mouth breather for years because if we have inflammation in the lungs, that same inflammation will travel up to your nose. And when your nose is stuffy, you're two to three times more likely to have a sleep problem, to snore, to have obstructive sleep apnea. And of course, this then is affecting your, your mental health. This is affecting your concentration. This is affecting your attention span. Now, you know, I'll talk about even for children. Karen Bonnock is a researcher from the United States. And she did a study in Stratford-upon-Avon in the UK, looking at children from age six months to 57 months. So it was over a few years. She looked at 11,000 British kids, children who were snoring or apneic, having stopping breathing for two breaths or more during sleep and mouth breathing. Those kids, if untreated by age five, had a 40% increased risk of special education needs by age eight. Now, we're not just talking about quality of life. We're talking about lifetime impact of chronic mouth breathing and 25 to 50% of studied childhood population mouth breathe. So Mel, this is a topic that doesn't even come top of the list. In actual fact, it doesn't even come on the list. And in the last few years, we've started to see a greater awareness of breathing and probably because it's too simple. But at the same time, breathing is not that simple either. I love absolutely everything that you said. And I want to take a gigantic neon yellow highlighter and make sure <laughs> as you're listening to us, you understand the single biggest takeaway that Patrick has just explained, which is if you want to have a change in your health, a change in your stress, a change in the pain that you may feel or the sleep that you cannot get, you have a free treasure trove inside your body if you simply start to change from mouth breathing to nose breathing. And we're going to unpack what that means. I have a question about a couple things that you said. I didn't want to interrupt you. But you said that breathing in and out of your nose increases the amount of oxygen versus breathing, you know, out of your mouth. Why does that matter? Well, I think it's very important. You know, oxygen is really, it's the fuel for the human being. And if, for example, we are not getting enough oxygen delivery to the brain, um, if there's an insufficient blood flow or oxygen delivery, it can increase brain cell excitability. So brain cells become more excitable. We're thinking more, we're more prone to anxiety. I remember writing a book back in 2010 called Anxiety Free. And I spoke about this paper that was published in 1988. And the paper said that the brain by regulating breathing regulates its own excitability. And then I was listening to a podcast by the neuroscientist, Dr. Andrew Huberman, about two months ago. And he cited the exact same statement and sentence. And it's funny how things come around, but this is the importance of breathing and the importance of knowing how to breathe right. If, for example, we are breathing the way you described in during the introduction, <laughs> and that's kind of the acute panic attack. But say, for example, somebody who's just breathing a little bit faster, yep. a little bit harder, upper chest breathing, irregular breathing patterns, and that's present in a minimum of 10% of the general population, but up to 75% of the anxiety and panic disorder population. 
So 75% of the population with anxiety and panic disorder have dysfunctional breathing. It's not just that stress levels change our breathing. Of course, when we are stressed, our breathing changes, but our everyday breathing is feeding into our stress levels. Who doesn't want to be more resilient? And the other thing about stress is when we have a lot of mind activity, it's impossible to do mindfulness. We have to be absolutely, we have to think of this ourselves. The next time that we're having a really bad day, and there's a lot of thoughts going through our minds. And I don't suffer from anxiety, but of course, things happen. That's the way it is as human beings. I can change my breathing patterns without having to be so aware of my breath to help to bring the body and mind into balance. And that's the thing about breathing. So coming back to oxygen delivery and blood flow. If, for example, even getting to the working muscles, if there's insufficient oxygen getting to the working muscles, well, we're more prone to fatigue. Um, in terms of the brain I spoke about. So like we have 50,000 miles of blood vessels throughout the human body and our breathing is influencing how dilated or not are they. And people with poorer breathing are more likely to have cold hands and cold feet. It's not just the blood circulation in the hands and feet that's problem. It's throughout the body. Uh, I feel like I might be your test uh, case here because now I'm thinking, <laughs> well, I wear socks to bed because when I touch my husband with my feet, he's like, ah, you're so cold. So one of the things that I read on your website and in your books that I absolutely loved was you said, breathing is not just for relaxing. It is an incredible tool when you get intentional about how you breathe every day to fight stress. And I would love for you to teach us right now how to stop being a dysfunctional breather and to breathe in a functional way in and out of our nose to get the maximum health benefit. Okay. So the first exercise that I'm going to start off with is small little breath holes. And this is going to introduce you to a means of helping to activate a relaxation response. And then from that, I'm going to show you an exercise to decongest the nose. Oh, great. Because okay. if you have a stuffy nose, inevitably it's going to cause mouth breathing. And then I will do breathe light and then breathe low and slow. Okay. So I'm going to go from one sequence into another. And this can be, it, it will be no more than five minutes. And we're going to cover a bit of ground. So I think people will have to replay this. So the first exercise, Mal, that I would like you to do, when the mind is racing and you're not feeling in form of focusing on your breathing, simply hold your breath in an exhalation. Take a normal breath in through your nose and out through your nose. And pinch your nose and hold and hold for five, four, three, two, one. Let go and just breathe normal now for about two to three breaths or even four breaths. Not to change your breathing, just breathing normal. And again, take a normal breath in through your nose and out through your nose and pinch your nose and hold five, four, three, two, one. Let go. And now just breathe normal for three to four breaths. So you're just breathing normal. The small breath hold will help to stimulate the vagus nerve, which secretes a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine, which causes the heart rate to slow down and the brain interprets that the body is safe. And again, take a normal breath in through your nose and out through your nose and pinch your nose and hold. Five, four, three, two, one. Let go. Breathe in through your nose. So now you're just breathing normal for three to four breaths. And in a couple of repetitions, then I will show you how to go from this to decongesting your nose. And again, normal breath in through your nose and out through your nose and pinch your nose and hold. Five, four, three, two, one. Let go and breathe in through your nose. Also, as you hold your breath, nitric oxide is pooling inside your nasal airway. Then when you let go, you're breathing in. You're carrying this nitric oxide into your lungs. Nitric oxide is antibacterial, antiviral. It's a bronchodilator. So for bronchitis, this is your natural way to help open up the lower airways. Last one. And again, normal breath in through your nose, out through your nose. Pinch your nose and hold. Five, four, three, two, one. Let go. So now we're going to go on to the nose unblocking exercise. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Yes. So when you say breathe normally, 
You mean not like how we normally breathe. You mean breathe in and out of your nose, right? Correct. Okay. Correct. Well, that's how we should be normally breathing. Well, I breathing. just, you know, most of us are probably <laughs> mouth breathers, so I just wanted to make sure everybody's getting the coaching that when he's cueing us to breathe normal, Patrick means in and out of your nose. And one thing I will tell you is even after the first round of breathing in and out of my nose and then breathing in and out of my nose and then pinching and holding for five, I started to feel almost that sensation of going down in an elevator. Like you really start to feel the pressure that you're not even aware that is built up in your body start to lower. So it had an immediate impact on me. Um, and I just wanted to point that out. Is that normal to experience that? I think people will have different experiences. Um, that exercise is very much an exercise we do with, with people who are prone to high stress, racing mind, panic disorder. See, the thing about breathing is we're, we as human beings, breathing is our it's such an important function, but every time that we get into a difficult situation, our breathing changes. And mm. when we start playing with the breath, we can often relive the situations in our history. So I'll give you this example. Somebody who's coming into me with panic disorder. Yeah. Every time that they've had a panic attack in the past, they've been breathing faster and harder in upper chest and they're feeling suffocated. Yeah. Now, even just placing attention on their breathing can make them anxious. And if I start doing any breathing exercises that alter the volume of breathing and it brings on air hunger, it can tip them into a panic. So we have to be very careful, too, about breathing in terms of tailoring the breathing exercises to suit the individual. Now, the next exercise I'm going to show you will decongest the nose. However, not to do this if somebody is prone to panic disorder or anxiety or pregnant or cardiovascular issues. Oh, OK. Now, despite that, it's actually relatively safe. So I would like you and do this. You know, you do all of these exercises. You always do them. You tune in to your body and do them to the level that you're comfortable with. OK, so with this exercise, Mel, you take a normal breath in through your nose and out through your nose and you pinch your nose. Just gently hold your nose and just nod your head up and down, holding your breath and keep holding your breath, keep holding, keep holding. Keep holding your breath, keep holding and let go there and breathe in through your nose. So when you do a breath hold after an exhalation, so if you hold your breath after a normal exhalation, that will help to decongest the nose. Now we need to do it five or six times. I got worried but about how much you were counting. I'm like, how long am I holding this? Oh my God. <laughs> so whenever you're ready, I take am. a normal breath in through your nose. Only normal. So I'm oh, going to have sorry. you just do that again. So remember about the subtlety of the breath. Just a light breath in. Patrick, there's so nothing it's... subtle about me. Here we go. Light <laughs> breath in, everybody. A light breath into your nose and a light breath out through your nose. And just gently hold your nostrils to stop breathing and nod your head up and down as you hold your breath. And keep relaxing into the body as you're holding your breath. Now, it's a very normal thing to hold your breath. Kids, if they go swimming... They'll do breath holds all the time. So it's a very normal human trait to go into the water and hold our breath. Now, as you hold your breath here, it's activating a slight stress response, which will help to open up the nose. And now let go, Mel, and breathe in through your nose. So the key to help decongesting the nose is to hold the breath for at least 30 seconds or so. But I would say when you start off, always start off gentle and just tune in on how is your body reacting to breath holding. I'll tell you what just happened. I literally feel like my nostrils are now the size of a Tootsie Roll. They <laughs> widened up and all of a sudden it was super clear because uh, my allergies are starting to kick in now that it's going summer to fall in the United States. And it worked that second time in particular, like, pew. yeah, no, it's a, it's a very reproducible technique. I've used it with thousands of people, and we we had a small pilot study involving twenty six people at a hospital here in Limerick, in Ireland, and a three month follow up. Symptoms of rhinitis, which are stuffy nose and runny nose, etc., had reduced by seventy percent, but 
I thought that pilot study, which was published as an abstract, I thought it would lead the way to generate some curiosity into a, a bigger study. It never happened. And that study took place 10 years ago. But despite that, the exercise works. Well, so Patrick, it's for people to try. We're here now. We want to know. And I, I felt like it worked. And this is, again, I, I have so many elementary questions that I'm almost embarrassed to ask this one. Well, please do. What coaching do you have for people that are so used to mouth breathing that breathing in and out of their nose is just, it just feels weird. And so they try it, but then they keep going back to the mouth breathing. How do you make this the new default given the health benefits? So there's two parts to it, to it. There's always theory first, a little bit of theory. Um, people have to understand about the importance of nose breathing. And in comparison to the mouth, the nose does all the work when it comes to breathing. And the second aspect of it then is breathing exercises, gentle exercises, you know, just for example, starting off with the two that we just did. And we also use, we use a, a very simple tape around the mouth that's elasticated that pulls the lips together. Oh, that's correct. I um, have we your actually tape. Use, that's the one. I have, I have tape. no samples here. I'm going to put it on right now, everybody. Last <laughs> night I taped my, we're going to get into mouth taping, but I literally so you have to stretch it mel about 30 or 40 percent so oh. it's only when you stretch it that you'll fe feel a tension oh i didn't even take off the sticky part okay so everybody it's like the shape of a of a of oh, a o. Er. yep and i stretch it by about 30 to 40 percent not, not too that much strong. okay like that not too much not too little maybe a little bit less okay and you're just stretching it and then placing it surrounding the mouth and the elasticated tension should be pulling the lips together so it should be mm -hmm. you should feel some tension there i do so with children and teenagers we very much use that as a training tool during wakefulness so because kids are kids and they get distracted and they're watching television they're on iphone the mouth is open right but for some adults as well so it can be a very helpful just so part of this is the training during the day so if an adult has the mouth open and they forget about it the tape will automatically remind them to breathe through the nose and it, it's all about changing habits it 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 definitely signals that i shouldn't be breathing out of my mouth having like the mouth open mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. well, <laughs> and then during cool. sleep when the person is comfortable with breathing through the nose and you know in terms of their nose being congested and bear in mind the one thing about the nose is that the the more we breathe through it, the better it works. Mm. But normally what happens is the nose gets stuffy. The person feels uncomfortable breathing through the nose. They switch to mouth breathing. And when they switch to mouth breathing, it increases their nasal stuffiness. So it's, again, it's a vicious circle. So I would also say to people that when you first switch from mouth to nose breathing, remember this is the natural way to breathe in and out through the nose. And even if you feel a slight air hunger or a slight feeling that you're not getting enough air, and when you're doing physical exercise, initially you might feel an increased sensation of breathlessness, stick with it. Slow down your intensity of movement in order to maintain nose breathing. Or in other words, only go as fast as you can while breathing through the nose. The benefits far outweigh the disadvantages. And the other aspect of it is, if you continue walking with your mouth closed, the body adjusts to it and mm. you then can do a physical exercise with less ventilation. So it's almost as if you're training your body to do more with less. There's so much to cover. Um, can you just bottom line it for people about what happens, like what's wrong with breathing out through your mouth? We know the benefits of breathing in, but what goes wrong when you're breathing constantly in and out of your mouth? I suppose the biggest one is that you lose moisture. So there's a 42% greater water loss breathing out through the mouth and losing moisture. If your mouth is dry and you're losing moisture from the body, of course, you're more likely to be dehydrated, but that will impact your dental health. Gum disease, bad breath, for example, chapped lips. But the other problem about breathing out through the mouth during rest is that it's a fast exhalation. And see, when we think about the body's relaxation response, it's all in the exhalation. It's not really in the inhalation. 
you can take a fast breath in or you could take a slow breath in. But really, when it comes to activating relaxation during rest, it's the speed of the exhalation. If you breathe out fast, it's a stressor. Yep. So if you breathe in fast and out fast, it's a stressor. It's not just how you breathe that way during stress, but if you deliberately breathe that way in your everyday, it's you're telling the brain that the body is under threat. You're going into this fight or flight response. And of course, your brain is here to protect you and your brain wants to get you out of the situation. So you don't want to be breathing fast going into a boardroom meeting, put it that way, because while you're going in, in person, in physical, your brain wants you to get out of there as quick as you can. So coming back to mouth breathing, if you breathe out through the mouth, there's less resistance to your breathing. It's a faster mm. breath out. So and it's, it's a, a bigger, stressful breath. bigger exit ramp because the mouth exactly. is bigger than your nostril. And so breathing in and out of your nose, as I, if I'm tracking correctly, one of the added benefits is that the exhale is going through something smaller than your mouth. So it slows you down. And in preparing to talk to you, we came across that Stanford study that you cite that uh, is on your website too, that, and I thought this was super cool, that your breath is like your brain's remote control, that there are actually neurons in your brain watching your breath. And when you start to breathe faster or out of your mouth, it signals to another part of your brain that something's wrong. And so I want to make sure you listening to Patrick and all of this research and the 10 books that he's written, what he is saying to you is that learning how to breathe in and out of your nose has extraordinary benefit for lowering stress, for lowering anxiety, for being able to focus. You not only work with people, Patrick, that are struggling with anxiety or sleep apnea, but you're also coaching athletes and high performers because your breath and being somebody that can breathe in a slow and steady fashion out of your nose helps you with focus. And so can we break down just the mechanics of the ideal normal breathing like how many breaths in and out if you're breathing normally in a healthy way in and out of your nose should you take in let's say a minute so typically during rest it's about 12 to 14 breaths but the only caveat there is how much air is involved with each breath the tidal volume so we can't just focus on the respiratory rate. We also need to focus on tidal volume because ultimately it's the volume of air that we are breathing. And if, if we breathe too much air, less oxygen is delivered throughout the body. Mm. So this is another aspect in, you know, there's a myth out there that if you want to bring more oxygen throughout the body, you take this full big breath. But if you take this full big breath, you're getting rid of too much carbon dioxide. The loss of carbon dioxide will cause your blood vessels to constrict and also red blood cells to hold on to oxygen more readily. Can you so coach coming me, back to your, can yeah. you coach me through this? Because if I take a dig, a big breath, like if I go in through my mouth and I'm like, oh, I'm trying to get a breath right. Oh, what happens yes. as I go to oh, get oxygen is my shoulders come up and I feel my chest pinch and I feel my stomach suck in and I actually can't get a deep breath because I can't get it below my boobs. Like I can't get it down into like that really satisfying full breath. Is that what you're talking about when you talk about the flow or volume or whatever? Yeah, there's two aspects. One is when you were talking about there, you're talking about shallow breathing, which is not ideal either. So we do want to breathe low with good recruitment of the diaphragm. How do you do that? And the the best way to do that is in and out through the nose. So if you, for example, if you place your hands either side of your lower ribs. Okay. So everybody, unless you're driving a car, I want you to get, I want you to cup your rib cage. Okay. Are we cupping the rib cage or we're going underneath it? Just on, just at the base of the ribs. Okay. So just at the base of the ribs. Got it. And as you breathe in, you're just gently directing your lower ribs to move outwards. Oh, how do, how do you And do as you breathe out, you're directing your lower ribs to move inwards. And the aspect is to hold your sides because normally when people put it on their belly, they're pushing and pulling their belly irrespective of their breathing. So that's why you have your hands on your sides. So Mel, as you breathe in, you're just gently guiding your ribs out. And as you breathe out, your ribs are gently moving in. 
Now, that's a deep breath in the true sense of the word. We don't hear it. You're breathing in and out through your nose and you're breathing slow and you're breathing low. Now, we can slow it down. If, for example, during rest, we want to have the ideal breath to have to bring the body and mind into balance, that's between 4.5 to 6.5 breaths per minute. So let's practice that with low breathing for just one minute. Okay. If you like. Yeah, I would. Can I ask a question? Of course. Before we do this exercise. So what I'm gathering from this is that I'm a mouth breather with bad breath who's causing myself stress and anxiety because I'm signaling to my brain with my shallow breathing that something's wrong. And that I always thought deep breathing because I practice yoga was this belly breath. And so I've always focused on inflate and deflate the stomach. And what you're talking about when you cup kind of the bottom of your ribs, because I want everybody to get this, you can watch it on YouTube. But for those of you listening to Patrick and to me, I want you to really get this, that it's really more of a horizontal thing. You're not inflating your stomach, you're making your bottom rib cage expand and come back in. And I'm realizing that so much of my breathing pattern has been almost like vertical up and down. And I hadn't been thinking about that. So that was super, super helpful. And you said that in a normal, just going about your life, you're not trying to relax. You're just trying to focus. You're going through your day. You're not trying to stress yourself out. You're getting the benefit of normal in and out of your nose breathing. You said that it would be somewhere between 10 to 14 breaths in and out of your nose in a minute. And now what you're about to show us is that for relaxation, you can do this kind of deeper breathing where you kind of fill your diaphragm horizontally, your rib cages move out, but it's for four to six times a minute. Is that what yes. we're about to do? Yes. Okay, great. I just want to make sure yeah. everybody's following. And just coming back to the diaphragm, like when the diaphragm, which is the main breathing muscle and it separates our chest from our abdomen. So during inhalation, the diaphragm is moving downwards. And it's the movement of the diaphragm downwards that draws air into the lungs. But as the diaphragm is moving downwards, you will have some movement to your front. So you will have some belly movement and movement to your sides and movement to your back. But I always think it's much better to focus on your sides because very often people, when they focus on their belly, they're pushing and pulling, pulling their belly, which has nothing got to do with their breathing. <laughs> and it's a good gauge of the generation of what's called intra-abdominal pressure, that when you breathe in, that your ribs are gently moving out. Because this is what's giving you a good indication of the recruitment of the diaphragm and from that then stabilization of the spine. So the diaphragm breathing muscle is really important because when you breathe with good recruitment of the diaphragm, it's also a calming effect on the mind. Mm -hmm. The diaphragm and the brain are connected. When we think of the phrenic nerve, and then we think of the mental health conditions such as schizophrenia and schizophrenic. So earlier on, you were talking about that work by Stanford, which I think is so cool, that there's a structure in the brain that's literally spying on our breathing. Now, we can use that to our advantage. Don't breathe fast. Don't breathe shallow because you're telling the brain that you're under threat and your brain is going to arouse you from sleep and put you into distress mode. So now we're talking about, well, say, for example, we have five minutes to spare. And instead of just scrolling aimlessly, wasting time on our mobile phone, give ourselves a little bit of attention, hmm. getting attention out of the mind and holding your attention to your breath, which in turn is training your brain to be focused, but not just about awareness. It's also about changing the physiology. So if you have your hands again, just gently on either side of your lower ribs. And as you're breathing in, that you're breathing in for a count of five. So you're breathing in two, three, four five out two three four five in two three four five out two three four five in two three four five out two three four five in two three four five out two, three, four, five. Now, I will say, Mel, say, for example, if we have somebody with pretty poor breathing and they're breathing 20 breaths per minute, 
I would say don't go from 20 breaths down to six all of a sudden. Gently soften your breathing, but do it, slow it down to a level that's comfortable for you. So if you're starting off, what you could be doing is maybe breathing in for two seconds and out for three. So that's slowing down the respiratory rate down to 12 breaths per minute. Um, in for three seconds and out for five. So during rest, we always need to think of the exhalation. It should be about one and a half to two times the inhalation, this, the length of the inhalation. Could you say that again about the length of the exhalation versus yes. the inhalation with the normal nose breathing? Because you've said repeatedly, the exhalation is the most important part. Yeah, the speed of the exhalation during rest should be about one and a half to two times that of the inhalation. And you can play with it. Like, I'll give you an example. If I'm having a meeting that's pretty intense, you know, I don't want to go into that meeting breathing fast and shallow. <laughs> I will deliberately, in that situation, nobody even knows what I'm doing. I could be sitting down or I could be standing outside the door waiting to go in. I will just take a soft breath in through my nose. I don't even time it. A soft breath in through my nose and a really slow and relaxed and gentle breath out. Because by doing that, I'm telling my brain that everything is okay. And I'm also taking my attention out of my mind and onto the breath to put the critical mind aside because I want to go into that meeting. And I want to be in a state of mind that I'm fully there. That I'm listening with all of my attention, not just lost in thought. Now, I would say don't wait until the important meeting before you start to do it. <laughs> start bringing it into your way of life. There was a story you were going to tell us. Yes. So there's a really well-known doctor from Italy called Bernardi. And he did a study back, I think it's in 2000. He looked at the breathing that was taking place when people were saying prayers of different faiths. Mm. So one was mantras and the other was the rosary, which is a prayer from the Catholic faith. And both, whether it was a mantra or the rosary, both of them lowered the respiratory rate down to six breaths per minute. Now, I think there's something really brilliant in this, that when we think of people who are saying prayers, it wasn't just from a spiritual and psychological aspect but it was also the effect it was having on their body and mind physiologically and it's so cool you know that this information was always out there and now it's time to to start embracing it well it's one of the reasons why i asked you the question in the very beginning what's the purpose and i was thinking about it kind of from a neurological scientific standpoint but there's something so much deeper that it really is the quality of your life that you have within you if you take the advice and you apply this research to your life and you start to teach yourself how to use the tool of normal nose breathing and longer exhales and you know you keep kind of talking about this soft and gentle that this is something that your body was hardwired with, a natural intelligence. And so it's really cool that the research shows that when people are in a state of being present, in a state of purpose, in a state of deeper connection, that you naturally, your body naturally drops in to this kind of breathing. And, you know, one of the things that I wonder is, what are, are there other specific types of breathing that people need to know about that either reduce stress or that you should use in certain situations? Yes, when it comes to breathing, um, you can downregulate, which is inducing relaxation, or you could upregulate. So, for example, if you want to stress your body and mind a little bit, okay. well, you could go for a jog with your mouth closed. It's a pretty safe way to do it. Jog you with your mouth closed? Jog with your mouth closed. Do you have to yeah. be in amazing shape to do that? I don't, I don't like, cause I, I hiking up the mountain that I live on, I'm panting like a dog. 
I don't know that I could get up there with my nose. Well, when you're walking up the mountain, go with a pace that you can sustain nasal breathing. And if necessary, get a nasal dilator, which just helps to gently open up your nose. But also breathe nose slow and low because your your ventilation is going to be more efficient. But physical exercise anyway is a stress, but it's a good stress, but it should be dosed according to the individual needs of the person. Like I do breath holds with athletes. I will have them breathe in and out and hold their nose and they sprint for 40 meters without breathing. Wow. They then rest for 30 seconds and they sprint again for 40 meters without breathing. Or I could have a 400 meter sprinter. And in some of their trainings, when they're well warmed up, I will have them nose sprint for 360 meters and the last 40 meters that they have to stop breathing. So we do exercises to stress body and mind. If you want to stress your body and mind using breathing techniques, just dip your toe into the water and just see how your body feels. And you don't have to hyperventilate for 30 breaths and then do a long breath hold. That's doing the entire thing. If you want to do a stress, maybe hyperventilate if you want to do it for five breaths and then do a breath hold, but it's comfortable for you. We don't teach hyperventilation. Gotcha. So, um, and the reason being is because my whole thing about breathing is I want to get persons every day breathing right. Let's get the foundation right first. I love that. And then, then if they want to do the, the, the peak, we can do that. Get the foundation for everyday life nailed first, in and out of the nose, low and slow. But the other thing, Mel, is anybody who's waking up at a dry mouth in the morning, like there's been any studies that investigated nose versus mouth breathing during sleep. The people who were breathing through their nose naturally during sleep always had a deeper sleep. So you can imagine a mouth breather during sleep. They're breathing faster. They're breathing harder. They're upper chest breathing. I'll give you this example. Do the sound of a snore through your mouth and it goes like this. <laughs> it does. <laughs> like a pig. <laughs> That's. And now... <laughs> Bring your lips together and okay. try and snore through your mouth with your lips closed. Only through your mouth, try and snore. So try and snore through your mouth with your lips together. Mm -hmm. I can't do it. So it's not possible. So mouth snoring stops once we get the mouth closed. The second snoring then is nasal snoring, which goes like this. Yes. Now, if you take a very soft breath in through your nose and a really slow and relaxed and a gentle breath out, and a very, very soft, silent breath through your nose and a relaxed and a slow and a gentle breath out. As you breathe very softly in and out through your nose, try and snore through your nose. So you will see it's more difficult. I can't. So mouth snoring, we can stop once we get the mouth closed. Nasal snoring, we can significantly reduce. The whole aspect in, in sleep medicine has focused on the airway but they haven't focused on the person's everyday breathing. And it's our everyday breathing that's influencing our breathing during sleep. And this comes back to, remember that study by Stanford? Yeah. If you're breathing fast during sleep, it arouses you from sleep. Who gets aroused from sleep? People with insomnia. They're breathing fast during their sleep. Their brain is interpreting that the body is under trash and the mm. brain wakes them up and they're there two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, thinking, thinking and thinking and thinking and then they're waking up exhausted and of course that's going to affect their productivity their focus during the day so you know we need to look at the big picture so how does breathing impact your sleep in terms of insomnia there's two times it can manifest and insomnia affects about 30 percent of the population wow and 10 percent have it chronic one is that we we go to bed at night, but we don't fall asleep readily. Typically, we should fall asleep in a few minutes. That's an ideal situation. But if we have overstimulation of the mind, we're not going to fall so, asleep so readily. So it's very important to be able to go into relaxation before we go to sleep. Mm. Now, that would involve, I would say, you know, use blue light filter glasses and follow sleep hygiene. Your bedroom is cool. It's airy. It's dark and all of that stuff. But also, we need to tell the body that we're going into rest and digest. Mm. So you could be sitting down. You might be watching some light TV. You might have your blue light filter glasses on. And as you're sitting there, really take a soft breath in through your nose, almost that you're breathing less air. And that's what I would like you to do. 
you're taking a really soft breath in through your nose and you're having that light and a really slow, 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 relaxed, gentle breath out. And then when you need to breathe in again, instead of taking your normal 100% of the breath, maybe take in about 70% of the breath in and then a really soft and slow, gentle breath out. And the whole aim is to breathe about 30% less air into your body than what you're normally used to. You know you're doing it correctly if you feel a slight air hunger. Now, as you do that, pay attention to the saliva in the mouth. So we'll continue for one more minute. I would like you to underbreathe, Mel. I would like you to breathe in a way that you feel that you're not getting enough air. How do you do that? Take a very, very soft, gentle breath in, almost as if your breath in is imperceptible and a really relaxed and a slow and a gentle breath out. So gently soften and slow down your breathing so that you're taking 30% less air into your lungs. If you get stressed, just take a rest. But keep working on this because now what you're doing is you're telling the brain that everything is okay and pay attention then to the saliva in the mouth. When we get stressed, our mouth tells us because our mouth goes dry. When we are ready for rest and digest, rest we feel sleepy. Digest we have increased watery saliva in the mouth. So when we alter our breathing, we're stimulating the vagus nerve, which is secreting that neurotransmitter acetylcholine, which is telling the heart to slow down. The brain is interpreting that the body is safe. And the brain is also spying on our breathing at the same time and interpreting that the body is safe. So we feel sleepy. And we do this for 10, 15 minutes before we go to sleep. Um, I know that you recommend people try this tape on their mouth uh, when they sleep. And I tried it for the first time last night. I did not have this fancy O-ring, so I used packing tape. I know that that's probably not yeah. what you recommend. And when I pulled it off this morning, I think I gave my upper lip a wax. But... Um, I, I put it from the nose down so that the sides were exposed and I learned something really interesting. I put the tape on my mouth so that I would be cueing my, myself to nose breathe and it's how I sleep. And I'm a fantastic sleeper. And I realized I sleep predominantly with my mouth closed. And my husband, on the other hand, he has this sound that he makes that goes, it drives me freaking crazy. I know it's sleep apnea. I also know that 1 billion people around the world have obstructive sleep apnea, 1 billion. How does this nose breathing improve even people's lives with obstructive sleep apnea? Okay. So obstructive sleep apnea is when the person stops breathing for 10 seconds or more during sleep, that would be an apnea or a hypopnea is when there's a reduction in the flow of their breathing due to partial collapse of the airways that their blood oxygen saturation drops down by about three or 4%. The problem with sleep apnea is that it arouses you from deep sleep, but it's very stressful. It's very stressful on the cardiovascular system. There are four characteristics in obstructive sleep apnea. It's not just the anatomy. So insomnia that we spoke about earlier on is one of them. So it's very important to be able to downregulate. Mm. Upper airway muscle recruitment, getting these muscles to do their job is very important. There's a therapy called myofunctional therapy that's excellent for that. Mouth closed with the tongue resting up in the roof of the mouth with good recruitment of the, in, the diaphragm helps to open up the airway. So you think of the typical middle-aged man we're drinking a few beers, we're putting weight on the belly. This is Im Im impacting the movement of the diaphragm. We're now breathing more up our chest. This is reducing lung volume and the throat collapses more easily. Our diaphragm breathing muscle, as I said earlier, is connected with the brain, but the diaphragm is also connected with the upper airway dilator muscles in the throat. Oh. So coming back to mouth puffing and the, the mouth closed is really important with obstructive sleep apnea. And there are a group of people with severe obstructive sleep apnea and people who may be obese as well. They're more prone to mouth puffing. You still need to allow them to mouth puff during sleep. And we we were lucky with the design of the tape, the myotape, because mm. it allows the mouth puffing. Whereas 
before that we were using 3m one inch micropore tape which is going right across the lips but that doesn't allow mouth puffing and that can make sleep apnea worse than some people oh so i'm going to come back to sleep apnea with taping of the mouth tested in mild people with mild obstructive sleep apnea just getting your mouth closed reduces the ahi which is sleep apnea severity severity by 33 percent wow so just with mild just by getting the mouth closed that's not looking at how do you improve your breathing patterns if you have somebody with obstructive sleep apnea and they bring nose breathing into their everyday life they learn to slow down their Mm. breathing they learn to have good recruitment of the diaphragm all simple skills that you bring into your everyday life that will help your sleep apnea from moderate to severe overall it helps when you get the mouth closed also but for some people with moderate to severe they need to be allowed to mouth puff so whatever you use as support to get the lips together, make sure it allows you to mouth puff. Got it. Well, I'm going to make sure to tape my husband's mouth with your tape, <laughs> and I'm going to stop shoving him or pinching his nose when he goes. <laughs> Can you explain why we sleep and why it's so important? It's a great question, actually. Not stupid at all. It's something that we've been looking for an answer to for the last 50 years, probably 70 years, and um, actually longer than that. Wow. But it's not um, it's not easy to come up with an answer because there are so many answers. There's so many things happening during sleep that can't happen at any other time that new answers keep bubbling up. So sleep is great for the immune system. It's great for cognition. It's great for the emotional system. It's great for growth and repair. What is the difference between being awake and being asleep? Like, is there like a physiological or neurological like difference between the two? Yeah, it's huge, actually. Um, So when we fall unconscious and into sleep, neurotransmitters, chemicals in our brain completely change the their composition. So there's a set of neurotransmitters that are uh, associated with wakefulness and being able to attend to the environment, have conversations, think thoughts, and they just completely switch when we fall asleep. So that one main one, which is called acetylcholine, which is really important for attention to the environment, switches off. And that's very conducive. Um, characteristic of non-REM sleep, which is the first states we normally go into when we fall asleep. So acetylcholine turns off in animals that sleep unihemispherically. What? Okay, that's a big word. What is <laughs> unihemispherically? <laughs> I can't even say the thing. I'm a fee the fee, seriously. Yes, unihemispherically means one hemisphere at a time. We have two hemispheres in our brain, and um, each hemisphere controls half of our body. And um, so the right hemisphere controls the left half of our body. So one hemisphere uh, of the brain is asleep, and the other hemisphere is awake. And the hemisphere that's asleep switches off the attention acetylcholine um, neurotransmitter, the chemical. But your brain is doing all kinds of essential things that can't be done during wakefulness. It's another quote unquote work time. It feels quite different than waking work. Um, then you can justify, hey, I need this. I'm going to feel better. I'm going to be able to uh, tackle my next day better. It never even occurred to me that it goes way beyond rest because what yeah. we're about to learn today is there's all these really critical health and mind health like functions yeah. that can only happen yeah. when part of the brain is in sleep mode. Is that right? That's I mean, right. Absolutely. Holy cow. Yeah. So why don't we start with um, what the perfect night's sleep Based on your 30 years of research, right? what does a perfect night's sleep look like? Just right. so that we have a benchmark for what would be ideal. I think if you just look at a 10-year-old, you'll get what the perfect night's sleep look like. looks like. They sleep beautifully. They have a beautiful homeostatic, which means um, it responds to what you're doing during the day, response and how long you've been awake. They have a beautiful circadian, which means uh, their body knows what time of day it is and what time they should go to sleep um, and what time they should wake up. And so the 10-year-old's sleep is perfect. Don't ever wake up a 10-year-old if you can possibly help it. Uh, They're doing a lot of really important things. And um, after that, 
our sleep changes during our teenage years, and we need just as much sleep as a 10-year-old, which is about 10 hours or 9 or 8, 8 to 10 hours for sure. But te- uh, teenagers' circadian rhythms change a little bit so that they fall asleep a little later and want to wake up a little later. So um, it's also a beautiful night's sleep if if they are calm and um, not too engaged with social media <laughs> at the wrong times. But... Um, but anyway, that's a great night's sleep. It's, our sleep is actually pretty great until we're about 40 or 50 years old. And then varying, depend on the individual, your sleep can start to become less efficient. And so what does a perfect night's sleep look like in terms of how long you sleep, the various phases of sleep? Right. Okay. So the perfect night's sleep for health mm-hmm. um, as an adult is something around seven and a half, eight hours, plus or minus an hour, something like that. Okay. You should be awakened by the sunlight, essentially. So that's something that resets our clock every day. And um, and then so you kind of work back from there from the time you need to awaken to get at least seven and a half, eight hours of sleep a night. Um, Different people need different amounts of sleep. Some people need more like nine. Some people are fine with six for a while. How do you know? You just have to know from your own body. (laughs) Some people, if they get six hours of sleep, they know already immediately when they wake up and going throughout the day, it wasn't enough. And so your body will tell you. Um, So... And other people, uh, you know, wake up at six hours and they're fine. They they feel great. And and one way to know is how sleepy you feel during the day. Okay. Yeah. You already said one takeaway that I want to make sure that you listening got from us, which is, you start with the time that you want to wake up, mm-hmm. and then you roll the clock backwards, mm-hmm. and you're basically saying that it's seven to eight hours, give or take an hour. Yeah. So you roll the clock backwards, probably seven to nine hours. Yeah. And that's when you need to fall asleep. Mm -hmm. That's right. And what happens when you fall asleep? Like, what are the phases that we go through as we're sleeping? The very first stage is, of course, dozing. And um, we don't really know when we're dozing, except that, you know, we sort of come conscious once in a while and say, oh, wow, okay, what happened in the last couple of minutes? I don't know. Because our memory starts um, not recording what we've been doing. And that lasts on average about two minutes before, you know, for example, if you're reading a book yeah. and you fall asleep reading the book, you won't remember the last two minutes of reading. Or if you're listening to a podcast, you won't remember the last few minutes of the podcast before you actually fall asleep. Or if I was talking to my husband and next thing you know, he's snoring. <laughs> right. He doesn't remember the last minute and a half of what I said. <laughs> That's exactly. <laughs> exactly. So there's that dozing period, mm-hmm. which I rather like. Mm-hmm. I love that sort of you kind of drift from mm-hmm. your mind spinning mm-hmm. to all of a sudden mm-hmm. almost like you're floating in a pool. Right. <laughs> that only lasts two minutes? Um, no. Stage one is variable. It's about, you know, two to five minutes, something like that. Okay. And yeah. you need that sort of stage one of dozing mm-hmm. to get into stage two. What, what happens right. next? Then stage two is really an exciting stage. So between stage one and stage two, there's something called hypnagogic hallucinations, which... <laughs> I'm not even going to try. Hypnagogic <laughs> solutionations? Hallucinations. Okay. hallucinations. Yeah. Okay. So it's our brain um, losing hold of reality and all kinds of imaginary imagination things happen. For example, it can be as boring as feeling like you're falling off a step mm. um, because not all of parts of your brain are asleep at the same time as you kind of drift into it. And so you feel the muscles relaxing and and part of your brain says, ah, I'm falling. And, you know, and the hallucination is incorporated into into that feeling of falling. And so you think, you know, you're falling off a step. Wait, is that why they call it falling asleep? That makes so much sense. And I have had that experience before where I do that dozing, my favorite part, you know, kind of drift off into the pillow. But then I every night have like a jerking sensation and it is like falling. It's almost like you're moving into the phase where your body is clumsily trying to turn your muscles off so you can drift into the deeper one. That's pretty cool. Now I know why I do that. 
Or it can be as horrifying as feeling like there's a monster jumping on your chest and um, shaking you. And it can be very, very disturbing as well if you wake up from it. Um, so they're pretty vivid hallucinations, almost like the dreams we have in REM sleep, only um, you don't have the atonia, which is your all your muscles being inhibited to prevent you from acting out the dream. So oftentimes people, if they have a vivid hallucination that's scary, can wake up from that and, and then feel like, oh, what just happened? You know, was there a monster in my room, really? I think that's the idea of nightmares. Um, comes from that idea of just the hallucinations, the weird hallucinations. That and this come. is as your brain is sort of trying to drop itself into yeah. a deeper state of sleep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. And not everybody, and most people, in fact, don't wake up from that N2. It's called N1 is dozing. N2 is that state of sleep, which has pretty vivid um, dreams, kind of. But they're not long story-like dreams like we have in REM sleep, but we'll get to that in a minute. So then from N2, which our brain is very active, we go into N3, which is also a time of activity, but it's really synchronous activity, like waves of activity going through our brain, and it's disconnected in time one wave from another, so consciousness can't be maintained. And you, if you wake someone up out of N3 sleep, slow wave sleep, and ask them what they were dreaming, they will not report having dreamed anything. It will be, you know, a blank slate. And it's actually pretty hard to wake someone up out of that state. It's, um, it's, yeah, it's a, uh, it's a deep, it's called a deep sleep. And what's uh, the purpose? You use the word wave. Mm -hmm. Like what is, what is actually happening in your body yeah. when you're in that third phase and the wave is happening? Yeah, yeah. So that's, um, a time when we know that our brain is cleaning itself, actually. Wait, what? Yes. <laughs> it's cleaning itself? Yeah, it's cleaning itself. Of like, what? Uh, of all the junk that builds up during the daytime when we're awake and alert. Um, what kind of junk builds well, up? Well, proteins get unfolded and, um, yeah, so uh, things break down, energy is used. All of that gets restored in that deep sleep, state of sleep. So, um, huh. What and, would happen if you clean. didn't get that deep stage of sleep and the wave, the cleaning wave? Mm, the I'm cleaning seeing wave. like somebody coming in after yeah. a big party and cleaning up all That's the cups. Right. <laughs> it's like this wave comes through your brain? It's like a wave cleansing the brain, yes. And it come, there's one per minute or so, actually one per second, actually. So a lot more often than that. And it sweeps from front to back. Um, and it just pushes all the junk into your cerebral spinal fluid and out into your Is that why body. my back hurts? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so, kidding. but yeah. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, yeah, so if you don't get it, you actually don't get a chance to clean your brain like that. So you really need it. Um, and that's the sleep you get mostly in the first half of the night after you fall asleep. So you go from N1 to N2 to N3. N3 lasts, you know, 20 to 30 minutes or so. And then you go back into N2 briefly and then into REM sleep, which is um, it's, it's called REM sleep. And how uh, is that different than the waves? So it's, it's very different. It's actually also called paradoxical sleep because if you look at brain activity, it looks just like someone's awake. Really? Um, why and thoughts are going through and um, dreams are happening. It's really strong imagery in your dreams. And um, that's when, if you wake someone up out of that state of REM sleep, they will always report a dream, you know, 90% 90, 90 of the time. Even people who, if you ask, say, oh, I never dream or I never remember my dreams, if you wake them up out of that stage, they'll remember. It's the reason why people... I think the reason why people don't remember their dreams is because they are solidly asleep and don't wake up out of that state. So um, don't worry, you do, you are dreaming. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I just think this is so cool. Now, I also read that sleep cycles last about 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. What does that even mean mm -hmm. and what is in a sleep cycle and why should we care? Right. Yeah, on average it's 90 minutes and that's when you go from N1 to N2 to N3 to N2 to REM. And that whole process takes on average in us about 90 minutes. In other animals it's shorter um, or longer. So um, 
We don't know why it takes the amount of time it does, but it seems to be important that it happens in the order that it happens, because if you disturb that order, if you, you know, um, get rid of one element of it, the whole process does not work nearly as efficiently or at all. So, huh. for example, if you just eliminate the REM sleep part, you can't consolidate your memories and put them together. If you eliminate the deep, slow wave sleep part, the N3 the state, cleaning. the cleaning part, you will wake up with a junky brain and not be as co- efficient and able to handle the day. Well, that kind of makes sense mm-hmm. because if you haven't brought the Zamboni into your brain to right. clean out all the junk, <laughs> yes. then you're not working with a clear palate yeah. when it comes to locking in yes. the things that are new. Yeah, that's right? right. Exactly. And so how many sleep cycles do we do in a night? About five. A five is, would be ideal, okay. actually. So um, that's... That's four, five, six and a half, seven hours of sleep, something like that. The first sleep cycle is a little longer than 90 minutes, um, probably because that N3 state is a little longer. And you don't have as much of it in the later part, the last half of the night. You don't have nearly as much N3 sleep. So if you miss the first half of the night, you'll miss most of that N3 sleep, which is the cleaning stage. So you don't want to miss that first half. <laughs> um, how would you miss the first half? Well, staying up too late, you know, staying up three hours later than you normally do. If you go to bed at 11 and now you're it's two in the morning and you're falling asleep, you'll get lots of that REM sleep, but you won't get near as much, if at all, any of that cleaning state. Okay. Hold on. Now I'm confused. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because I thought that If you fall asleep, Mm -hmm. that's like, let's just say the clock's at zero. You Mm -hmm. fall asleep, whether it's at nine o'clock at night Mm -hmm. or one o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. That's hour zero. Mm, No. No. Uh -uh. Wait, wait, what? (laughs) Your body knows what time it is of day it is. So your body knows the difference between nine o'clock at night and two in the morning. Um, So if you chronically go to bed late... Mm Your brain is jumping to the second half of sleep. No, okay. how would you, like? Because I don't understand how you would miss right. the the way the the wave coming through and cleaning your brain out right. if it typically happens in the first. So if you go to bed late chronically and yes. wake up late chronically, yes. then your body says, "Okay, it's it's aligned with your wake up time." It's actually what it aligns with best is the light that you're exposed to during the day. Okay, what is the purpose of the second half? The second half is for, I like to think of it as more creative. It's creative Hmm. part. It's emotional resolution and creative um, building of new, new schema. Or um, so, yeah. So the first half of the night is, let's do a little correction. It's more for kind of locking in, like you said. strengthening and sealing the things that you learn during the day. But the second half of the night, or REM sleep more like, every REM cycle um, is more for building new schema and and making new connections and changing your mind and resolving the emotional um, aspects of your memory. So, for example, um, if you remember a painful event, whether it's emotionally painful or physically painful, that happened a year ago or 10 years ago. You will want to remember that because it's adaptive and it's good to have those memories, but you won't want to recall when you're remembering the event, the actual pain. You Mm. don't want to feel the pain again, either emotional pain or physical pain. Um, That's not adaptive. You don't need that part of it. And so um, in our research right now that we're doing uh, in collaboration with uh, a few other laboratories, we're discovering that it is that REM sleep period, specifically the REM sleep period, and you get much more of it in the second half of the night, that helps to separate out the novelty and the immediacy and the physical reality of the emotions of those memories from the facts, the semantic facts that you put together that you can recall for for the rest of your life. And that's what happens normally. But people who have insomnia and they don't have good quality of REM sleep, their norepinephrine or noradrenaline is too active because they're too anxious um, while they sleep, then they don't have that distancing from the immediacy and the saliency and the sense that 
it just happened today. Um, so that's that's what we're looking into. That's right now. really profound mm. and exciting in terms of that kind of insight. Because if you think about it, I would imagine it's also applicable to somebody that has a lot of trauma. Yeah. Um, somebody that uh, has a lot of chronic pain, Mm -hmm. that all of that is a very real, lived, stored experience in your body. And if your brain is not able to get that seven to nine hours Mm -hmm. of sleep where Mm -hmm. it can do all of this functioning for a health and a mindset and neuroplast, I mean, I think the implications of that, because what you're basically saying is, that having good sleep habits and consistent sleep habits actually can help you heal. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Not only can help you, but it's necessary. It's necessary to yeah, heal. It's necessary to heal. One of the things that I found really interesting in your research is the importance of a consistent bedtime mm-hmm. and a growth hormone that gets released. Yeah. And um, why is that? connected to a consistent bedtime. Right. Well, growth hormone is the thing that helps you repair your muscles, build proteins um, involved in consolidating your memories and um, just rebuilding damaged parts of your body. That um, gets released in little spurts, if anything, all day long and while you're awake. But when you go to sleep and your circadian system is aligned In other words, you're going to sleep at the right time relative to your clock, um, which means that melatonin is being released. Melatonin and growth hormone together gets the release of growth hormone to be 10 times higher than it is um, when you're awake. So it's a big spurt of growth hormone that can do things that little spurts can't do. What does a growth hormone do? Growth hormone helps you build proteins. Um, All those amino acids that you eat during the day need to be built into proteins and proteins that get broken down during the day when we're uh, and misfolded um, can get built back up uh, during during sleep. And it's really only sleep. If you delay sleep uh, so that it's past the time when your melatonin surge is going, then the growth hormone surge can't be nearly as big. You know what question I'm about to ask next, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Does a melatonin supplement help spike that? Like, uh, is that a way or not really? Or We don't know, actually. We don't know, but I, I, I doubt it um, because it's not just melatonin. There's a lot of other things that are happening simultaneously with that melatonin, and, and it signals other parts of your body. The other thing about melatonin supplements is that they're not re- regulated by the FDA, so... In any one melatonin supplement, there may be zero melatonin, or there might be 10 times what you need. It can actually help all of the processes that happen normally in the first few hours of sleep. I am fascinated by this. Mm-hmm. And I start to see how now the inconsistent bedtime mm-hmm. now is also screwing up mm-hmm. the signaling. Yeah. Like imagine, like I think about it this way. When our three kids were little, they had a bed night routine. Mm-hmm. Same bedtime, the same routine. We're winding down. We're picking up the toys. We're saying good night. Mm-hmm. We're going up for the bath. Mm-hmm. We're reading the bedtime story. Yeah. You're in your pajamas. You have the little song or prayer or whatever, the yeah. kiss on the forehead. Mm-hmm. You turn off the light. And it was this, this intentional pattern mm-hmm. that was training our kids. Right. It's time to wind down and yeah. sleep. That's right. And it sounds like that's exactly what we need as adults. Yes, we need the same thing as adults. <laughs> exactly. You've put it really well. And in fact, you mentioned a bath. Yes, I take one every night. Yeah, it really helps you sleep better. Why? Um, <laughs> it's thought to be because you are warming um, your periphery and vasodilating your hands and feet because Whoa, they're nice and sexy. warm. Vasodilating. That's what I'm going to say to Chris. Chris, I'm going to go vasodilate. <laughs> <laughs> My hands and feet in right. a hot bath, honey. Right, yes. Um, <laughs> and, and vasodilation is good because what that does is it then helps cool your core, which is something that happens as you fall asleep. The core of your body cools by half a degree, something like that. And people get the best night's sleep 
if they can have warm hands and feet out there exposed to the air helping to cool your core. So that's great. Also, to have a great night's sleep, exercise during the day. Our bodies are made to exercise. They are made to move. And if we get a good time of exercise where our blood is racing and our hearts are pounding and our um, breathing is deep, then for some reason, and we don't know exactly why, it might be due to adenosine buildup Mm -hmm. or needing growth hormone and the signals your body gives you says we need to repair ourselves. It gives you a really wonderful night's sleep. So those two things are beautiful. A bath and exercise. Mm -hmm. You heard it here and bright light in the morning Mm -hmm. and a consistent bedtime. Those four things that you are giving everybody for free based on decades and decades of research. Yeah. And not too much caffeine too late. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's number five. <laughs> yes. Not too much caffeine, everybody. <laughs> Thank you for explaining that, Dr. Poe. And one of the things that I love as I listen to you is I'm realizing you're designed to sleep well. Like this is part of your hardwiring, your natural intelligence, your DNA. You run on a circadian rhythm and sleep is a critical function. So this is something that we can all learn how to do better. Yeah, that's right. right. Exactly. So you're mm-hmm. one of the uh, most renowned sleep researchers in the world. What is your sleep routine? What time do you go to bed? Like, when do you stop looking? Like, kind of yeah. walk us through your evening. You've yeah. had dinner. Then what do you do for your optimal sleep? <laughs> that's a great question. Um, so sometimes I have to work after dinner in the okay. evening. But um, the best time for me to go to sleep is around 11 or 10.30 at night. And um, so if I put can put away my work um, by an hour before that, that's the best time for me. Take a shower. Oh, that would be amazing and usually good. And, um, and then in bed, what works great for me is either just prayer and uh, relaxation, deep breathing, or um, I can distract my racing brain with a really dumb little game on my phone with my phone set to non-blue Wait, I'm like, it, wait, wait did, did, did the sleep researcher just tell me she's playing a game on her phone? Right, but I turn off the blue light. I feel light. like I need to delete this. <laughs> it's a dimmer screen and oh, it's see, non-blue See, now you look light. embarrassed that you're actually saying, I'm yeah, proud no, of no. you for admitting yeah, it. No. Everybody was just like, she's normal. <laughs> God, thank God. I play a game How called... do you block the thing on the... On the blue light? Oh, yes. it's, it's a setting on my phone. Just, uh, you know, you can oh take away gosh. the blue light. Okay. Yeah, and so the dumb I game is something... I don't recommend this, by the right. way, everybody. <laughs> the dumb game is something that's not mentally challenging. And, of course, if I lose, it's okay. So I, I just, and, you know, it's threes where you stick numbers together to form three. And then anyway. Um, so, yeah, and within 10 minutes, I'm usually, I'm out. Um, wow. Yeah. I wow. don't even bother putting my phone all the way on my nightstand. I just... Don't drop it. Okay. <laughs> Just drop I, it. I don't even like to have the phone in the bedroom. No, it's better to have it not in the bedroom. And, and of course, my phone is set to do not disturb mode so that okay. it's not disturbing me. And okay. it doesn't. Yeah. All right. Mm-hmm. Um, it's better to have it not in the room. And for some people, actually, what works great also is reading a book, um, whatever it is. It's just relaxing. And within 10 minutes, you know, 12 minutes, you should be asleep. Wow. How do you know if you're getting enough sleep? Based on the things that you study, yes, because you hear um, eight hours. Yeah, how many how many hours do you sleep? By the way, um, the older I get, the more boring I am. <laughs> so I would say nine or ten. Yeah, I love that. Um, people who sleep less than six hours have a higher mortality. They have lower mood, um, and they ha- are hungrier, as we said, with the leptin. Huh. Um, what you want to do is really to realize how much sleep you need is when you sleep without an alarm, how many hours do you sleep? And not when you're sleep deprived. But oh, I bet I sleep 10 hours. Yeah. That's... If I don't have an alarm on, I sleep way longer than I think I'm going to. When you look at the last couple of weeks of your life, yes. the best days, the when you felt the most refreshed, the best mood, 
were the days I got the best, um, the highest amount of sleep. That's by how far. Much, that's how much sleep you need. And every American that's listening to this is going to be like, I can't sleep that much. But you think about your best days of your life happened when you slept adequately. It changes your hunger hormones. It changes your hormones in general. You know, for women especially as we get older, um, this is important. It changes your mood. It changes your ability to uh, uh, make decisions. Yeah. And your interactions with other people. So why would you want to skimp on that? Why would you say that you'll be like everybody else, you know, sleep when you're dead? When you look <laughs> at the data, the data says opposite. It says if you don't sleep, you'll be dead much earlier. That's true. If you don't sleep, you will be more depressed, more anxious, have more uh, hunger and craving signals. You are going to be a version of yourself that is, is a shell of what you want to be. So one final thing that I think would be extremely helpful to people. Let's assume that we went to bed early and we wake up and we get a good night's sleep. Can you walk us through what you would recommend the eating routine or what is on our plate and when are we actually eating? Okay. For Mel uh, for like, you know, complete hormone yes. balance. Yes. Um, okay. So as you know, it's everybody is different and yep. their life circumstances are different. Every time I do this, uh, you know, people say, oh, but I work night shift or right. I have little kids. I get it. Like life is, I had many years where I didn't get enough sleep, where I didn't get enough sunlight, where I couldn't make the best decisions because I was just so pulled in, um, you know, all the different directions. Uh -huh. So I get it. But we didn't even talk about circadian rhythms, but Mel, sunlight and darkness run our bodies. We have internal clocks in every one of our cells. So routines are excessively important okay. in terms of our mood and our, um, our body, our nutrition. So when you wake up in the morning, you want to get sunlight. I have a rule that I learned... Um, from someone online, basically, I did this for a few days and I felt the best I've ever felt. And I'll tell you what it is. When you wake up, instead of scrolling your phone, yep. checking your messages and your emails, go get sunlight first. Sky before screens. Oh, I love that. So sky before screens is how you should start your day. Your body is wired to see sunlight in the morning. Even if it's a cloudy day, it just has to be bright light. Okay. Uh, you can just walk out outside. For me, it's my back door. Just walk out for a few minutes. It could be two to 10 minutes. You could do, um, for me, I'm usually just in my pajamas. So I'm coming back in and getting ready for the day. Okay. So you don't want to have food or caffeine in the first 45 minutes of your day. Why? I'll tell you why. When you wake up, you feel groggy, right? Yep. That grogginess is partially, mostly from adenosine in your brain. Adenosine. Adenosine. Okay. And it clears out, as you know, within 30, 40 minutes, mm. it clears out. Then you have your coffee. Then you eat your food. And the reason why is coffee, the way it works, it, it blocks our adenosine receptor. So that means that it doesn't help get rid of the adenosine. It just blocks it from from actually binding. Okay. So if you don't let the adenosine clear out and you just drink your coffee, when the coffee wears off in a couple of hours, that adenosine is still there. And it just oh. binds those receptors and you feel excessively tired. And that's why you think you need another cup of coffee. And then you're fully dependent like the people that wake up and they need the coffee right then and then they need it again at like 10 o'clock and then they need it again at one o'clock it's because you're not letting that adenosine whoa go okay you need to let that clear out i'm guilty of this so yes. i am going to try this tomorrow i am going to absolutely have my coffee and then oh no i'm not <laughs> i'm gonna wake up i'm gonna wait 45 minutes yes. then i'm gonna have my coffee i'm gonna see if i have a craving for a second cup yes that is fascinating. Okay. So you want to let it uh, clear out naturally because it's not going to clear out naturally if you start the caffeine cycle right away. Got okay? it. So clear it out for 45 minutes. Get our sun in. What's next? Um, eat. 
Okay. So no intermittent fasting. So everybody, I love intermittent fasting. Then why are we eating? Because I do it the opposite way. Talk to me. There's very good evidence that for thousands of years, we ate in one scheduled way, okay. which is daylight hours. Oh. There was no microwaves, Uber Eats, you know, there was, they had a fire and you'd maybe eat an hour or two after sundown. That's it, right? Yep. You are not snacking at midnight. There's nothing, there's nowhere to store the food thousands of years ago. Our internal clocks are set so that when melatonin hits two to three hours before bed, your organs shut down. Mm. You cannot process sugar as well as you did. You can't take it into your muscles. You are not uh, processing, you're not releasing digestive enzymes. So basically, when you're eating late at night, you're waking your body up in the middle of the night and asking it to do a math problem. Your body is going to be like, I don't want to do this. I'm going to make mistakes. Yep. You wake up and you're tired and you're pissed that someone woke you up in the middle of the night. That's what happens when you eat late at night. Holy smokes. You put your body in conflict with itself. Yeah. And so intermittent fasting, everyone's doing it the wrong way. They're eating way late into the night and then they don't eat all day when the sun is out, right? Like that's the time that you're what your body's ready for food, right? So ideally, you know, you wait an hour because it's it, nobody needs to be eating every minute of every day. Yep. Uh, Americans just, we just eat 14 to 16 hours a day. It's just too much, right? So you wake up, maybe you get some movement in, you get your sunlight, you eat about an hour or two even after you wake up. You don't okay. need to push it to two, three, four o'clock. Like people are doing this thing. There's good evidence that skipping meals is actually bad for you and that people who do it habitually actually have worse health outcomes, okay? Got it. So eat your breakfast. You want to have a high dopamine breakfast. Yep. Uh, let's have, you know, cottage cheese, eggs, tofu scramble, veggies, nuts, berries. Okay. Great. When do I eat next? Then you I'm eat... already hungry. Yeah. Well, no. I, am I hungry right now? Yeah. Are you would hungry? I eat vegetables? I would eat vegetables there right you now. Go. So then that must hungry. mean I'm hungry. But I got to have a glass of water first, and then I'm going to ask myself that Are again. You... Yes. So See, can... I'm learning. Then you tune in with the inner Mel, you know, the, the yep. brain gut Mel. Yep. Okay. So then you can eat when you're hungry. Again, you can use your inner cues. Could be 12, could be one, whatever your inner cues. Okay. You'll notice your ghrelin is set to, uh, to on a timer. Every day you'll get hungry at the same time. So hello ghrelin. Yeah. It just dumped on, it just, it just, I think dumped on me. Yeah. So what do you eat for lunch? So basically lunch is a chance for you to get, f the more, the healthier you eat earlier in the day, the better your chance of um, sticking to it. So okay. they always say exercise and eating healthier foods, breakfast and lunch is your best chance. So for me, okay. I automated and I had already talked to you when we had talked before that I try to eat the same things every day. So what do you eat for lunch? So I eat a salad for lunch. I usually put a protein source on it. It could be different beans, nuts, it could get tofu, you could do eggs, you could do salmon, whatever you want, protein and veggies, a salad with um, protein on it. And, the, and I always have a fermented probiotic food with my lunch because that's the best time for you to get in at least one to two servings of the kimchi of the sauerkraut it could be um, kombucha for a you know a drink um, apple cider vinegar in your dressing yep so that's when you have the best chance really simple okay. it can be very simple and then your dinner is when you want to eat if you Serotonin, are someone baby. yes you're learning. I'm paying attention. So um, if I know it's not sexy to say eat carbs, but carbs actually can be very healthy for you, especially in vegetable form, sweet potato, quinoa, whatever it is, um, you can eat that later in the day if you want to have that big boost of serotonin. And what about snacks? If I'm like legit hungry, but I'm not really craving anything, Yes. but I'm legit hungry midday, what's your go-to snack? So- Remember that protein has this effect on your body that it tells your hunger to hunger hormones to stop. So if you want more leptin, eat more protein. So your snack can be yogurt. Your snack can be a protein shake. Your snack can be um, a, a 
piece of cheese. It can, you know, something with protein because that will keep your dopamine levels up okay. and it will keep your hunger hormones hormones stable. So protein snack, I think women especially, we're eating just too little protein. There is a theory yes. that the reason we get fat from eating ultra processed food is because it's so low in protein that your brain never gets the signal that you're full. Your protein threshold is never met. Wow. One final thing I want to ask you, because we didn't really cover it, gluten. Everybody I know is gluten-free. Yeah. It's not the gluten. There's very few people who are actually allergic to gluten. It is very common to have GI issues with processed gluten, so when you eat a lot of bread, pizza, carbs, but that's not the gluten itself. It's the fact that you're eating processed mm. food. So gluten gets mislabeled all the time. What I say to people is go gluten-free for a few weeks, three to four weeks. Okay. See how you feel. When you add the gluten back, don't add back the bread, the cookies, the cakes, and the processed gluten. Add back a small wheat bulgur, like in a in a salad. Okay. Um, add back um, a healthy sourdough bread. Okay. Add back, you know, wheat in small, unprocessed amounts, and then see how you feel. And what I realize is that people villainize gluten all the time, and in America, gluten free um, has become such a tagline that those foods are. Uh, more unhealthy. Oh, because of all the processing. Look at you, Dr. <laughs> Amy. Is there anything else on this topic that we did not get? I think we covered so much. I, I think, um, like you said, and I have taken this to heart, is that there's no pill that's going to save you. There's no person that's going to save you. You, when you learn about all this, when you actually listen to your own self, you're going to be the one who saves yourself. Well, Dr. Amy Shaw, <laughs> let me just say thank you. Because without this information, we can't save ourselves. And you've explained the internal, extremely elegant but complicated systems inside of us so that it makes sense, so that we understand why these choices, these substitutions, why it actually matters. Like that's my huge takeaway. I have never actually understood any of this at the level that you just explained. And that's an enormous gift. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for checking this video out. And if you like this one, I have a feeling you're going to like this one too. I'll see you there.